case you didn't notice there was a change in schedule and our next speaker is Heike, which will talk about the wire protocol. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, this, this presentation is about the Postgres wire protocol. Um, the current protocol is called the protocol version three. Uh, that's the protocol that Postgres uses. Uh, it was introduced in server version 7.4, which is, I don't know, 15 years old now at this point. So that's the only, only protocol that matters. There was a version two that, but the support for that was dropped in version 14. You might still find some drivers around that might support that, but for all practical purposes, the version two is dead. Uh, and this presentation is about the version three. It's not that different from version two, but anyway, let's forget about the old versions. I don't know why, what came before version two. I don't know if version one ever existed. I've never seen that. Uh, maybe back in the Berkeley times. Um, the the Postgres protocol is used, used obviously by PostgreSQL, uh, but there's also a lot of libraries, like all the client libraries speak that. It's used in uh, all the connection poolers that Postgres works with needs to understand the protocol, but there's also other stuff like there are, uh, there are other products like uh, forks of Postgres that also use the same protocol. There are completely different, you know, database implementations that have just copied the protocol because, you know, that's very handy. All of your drivers, you, you can use any of the existing drivers and so forth. Uh, so as I've worked with the Postgres protocol, this is actually a bit of a problem for Postgres. We keep, when, if we try to extend the protocol or change it, it's not just Postgres that matters. It, it's not just the code that we control, uh, but we kind of, you don't want to break any of those other things either. Um, but yeah, let's, let's get started on what the protocol looks like. Um, basically all of the communication happens as a stream of messages. So throughout the presentation, I will talk about message types and all of the messages, messages look like this, like there's always a first one byte that identifies what kind of a message it is. It's the message type. Then there's a four bytes length field, uh, which is the size of the message, but for some reason not including the the, the message type byte, so it's a bit weird. Uh, but anyway, and then the remaining contents of the message depends on what kind of a message it is. And uh, the Postgres documentation includes information about all of the message type, like there's a directory of that. Uh, so you can go and look up in the Postgres docs, the actual contents of, of, these, of these messages. But for example, here is a here is a message, it's the simple query message, uh, which is very simple. It's just this, uh, it, it, the message content is just the query you want to run, uh, just as an example. But first, let's start by looking at what happens when you open a new connection to Postgres. Uh, you first, well, you open a TCP connection first, or maybe Unix domain socket, uh, but probably TCP. And the first thing that happens is that the client sends the first message, uh, which can be one of these ones. If you're using TLS, you're probably going to be sending us SSL request of message first, but there's other options. There's the stop, stop target, and I'll, I'll go through into details of this. Uh, if you're doing TLS, the, the client begins by sending it an SSL request to the server, and the server responds with, yes, I can do TLS or it sends, no, I can't do TLS. Uh, and then the client has the option of, okay, let's continue, or, or, or you can hang up if you don't like the answer you got. Starting with version 17, there's also a possibility to kind of skip this handshake and go directly to open a TLS connection, which is nice. Uh, but it's gonna take a while for until the ecosystem kind of catches up to that. I, I don't think the connection poolers generally support that yet. Drivers don't support that yet. And older versions of Postgres don't support that yet, but I expect that in five years, when you know uh, the ecosystem catches up, this will probably be more common than going through the SSL handshake. The next thing that the client will send is so-called uh, startup packet. So this is an important message that contains stuff like the protocol version you're speaking, which is always three at the moment. Uh, the list of supported protocol extensions, which is always empty at the moment because we don't, we don't have any. Uh, it's going to contain, it contains the database name you're connecting to and the username. And these are important because the server uses these, the database name and username to match against your uh, like pghva.conf 
to see what you're allowed, whether you're allowed to connect or not, and what kind of authentication should you use. So that's why they're part of the startup bucket. Then you can also have these optional settings. Uh, clients typically set uh, application name. If you're writing an application, please set it. It's very useful for uh, to look at the logs and so forth later. Uh, but other stuff like uh, client encoding, uh, a lot of clients set that, and you probably should. Uh, time zone, uh, date style, interval style. There's a lot of these settings that many, many clients uh, set in, as part of the startup packet already. Next stage, once the client has sent the startup packet, the server will respond. Uh, or you will go into the authentication phase, and this stage, the, the server will send one of these messages, uh, depending on the kind of uh, authentication you had. Like if your pghba.com says trust, then nothing really much happens. The server just sends immediately on authentication OK, and that's the end of the authentication. There was nothing to do. But if you're using password authentication, Scram, uh, or some of these other things, the next thing the server will send is like a challenge response thing, uh, like clear text password, which means it requests the client to please just send me the password in clear text. Your client might not like that, so it might hang up. It might want to hang up at that point, uh, or maybe it's okay. Uh, the SASL stuff here is for Scram, so we have like the Scram authentication was built in a way that it follows the SASL uh, specification for how to do authentication. Uh, but we only use it for Scram at the moment, but we have a little bit of like room for extensibility there if we want to introduce new authentication mechanisms in the future. We could use SASL and then SASL has its own negotiation mechanism as well built into these messages. Uh, but again, currently it's just for Scram. Kerberos, GSS. It's worth noting that not all of these kind of map directly to like what you have in pghpa.conf. Uh, you might be using LDAP authentication, for example, but there's no LDAP here. That's because the LDAP authentication actually uses the clear text password mechanism. Like the client sends the password in clear text, but the server then uses LDAP to look up the, the right password hash uh, from LDAP. And I think the radius is similar to that. Uh, so we can't just get rid of the clear text password either because it's actually used by some of these other authentication mechanisms you, you might not think about. Uh, what's also missing from here is the TLS certificate authentication. Uh, that's because the TLS handshake happened all, earlier already and uh, the TLS certificate was already exchanged as part of that. So by the time you get to this authentication phase, the, the server already has the certificate in, and it will just say an authentication okay or reject the connection directly. So there's no more handshake needed at this stage. So just to put this all together, this is kind of the simplest, simplest possible handshake. The client sends a startup packet and the server responds with, okay. Um, in the simplest cases, that's all that happens. Uh, if there's no passwords, if there's nothing else. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, but it, we have also a step for protocol negotiation. So if the server doesn't support the minor protocol version that the client requested, it will respond with the negotiate protocol message. And then the client can accept the lower, like fall back to the lower version, or it can hang up if it doesn't want to do that. This is, you don't see this in the wild today because we don't have any of these minor versions or extensions that it would be used for, but the code is there. So if you write a client that tries to use a higher version which doesn't today exist, the server will, will, will respond with this message. Um, but yeah, this is uh, as we start to get more protocol extensions and we kind of evolve the protocol in the future, we'll start to actually see this in the wild as well. Here's a more complicated case, probably the most complicated case I could come up with. Uh, in this case, there's one message I didn't uh, mention earlier, like there's another way to do encryption aside from TLS, you can also use GSS encryption, which I'm not entirely sure how that works, but it's similar to TLS in that the client sends a GSS request, server responds, no, I can't actually do that. Well, the next the client will try to do, well, can you do TLS? Sends a SSL request and now the server says, yes, that's cool. Then, the, then you will go through the normal TLS handshake, the client hello, server hello, change cipher sets. I think I've missed a few packets there as part of the TLS handshake. 
Uh, but now you established an, uh, like a TLS connection. And then you send the startup packet. I included the negotiate protocol here that goes in, in that slot. Now you do the, like, in this case, it's Scram authentication. So you go through the few steps of Scram authentication with these authentication SAS all messages, response, continue, response, complete, and finally authentication OK. So this is kind of the as complicated as it gets uh, today. There's a few round trips here, which is a bit expensive. Uh, but you know, in most cases, it looks a bit simpler. We're almost there. That's not actually everything that happens. After the authentication, the server will send a few more packets. Uh, there's a message called backend key data, which basically includes the uh, uh, query cancellation key, which which the client can use later to do uh, query cancellation. So in PSQL, if you have a long running query and you hit Control C, uh, the the PSQL will use the query cancellation key. It's like a secret token uh, for that connection, like a random token. Uh, that you can use to uh, authenticate that you're allowed to uh, cancel that that query. The second message is the parameter status message. There's actually, I think, I think the server sends one for each uh, each of these gux. There's a there's a bunch of options that are always reported. Like the server always reports the current value to the client. I think that includes client encoding, um, date style. Maybe there's a few of these uh, that that are kind of important for the client to always know. So the server always sends the current value in this stage. And also later, if you set, like if you change any of these settings with the set command, the server will also send these extra messages at the protocol level uh, with the new value so that the client library driver will always know what is the current value. Finally, the server sends a ready for query message, which just means, you know, now you can actually start to run regular queries. That's the end of the handshake part. Any questions on this part before we go on? Cool. Feel free to add. Go ahead. Is there any stage where the server sends the client the version? Ah, yeah. Uh, I think it sends one of these parameter status messages for that as well. Yes. So yeah, you would know it at that point. Yeah, the client doesn't know which version it's speaking to until after authentication. So that's one interesting tidbit, I guess. What is a good tool besides Wireshark to watch what's going on? Wireshark is a good tool. <laughs> it's very good. Yeah, SlipDQ has a present option too. Yeah. So let's move on to how you actually run queries. There's two ways. This is what's called the simple query protocol. And then there's the called what's called the extended query protocol, which is not quite so simple. Uh, usually you want to use the extended query protocol because it has more features. It can view query parameters, prepared statements, cursors, all of that stuff, which are good things to have. Like if you're writing a driver, that's what you want to use. Um, there's really only one feature, I think, like one reason why you would prefer to use the simple query protocol, I think, uh, which is if you want to have um, like multiple statements, like select foo, select bar, and you want to send them as a single query to the server, just separated by semicolons. Uh, in the simple query protocol, the server accepts that. Uh, in the extended query protocol, you get an error. Uh, but that's, I think that's the only case where why you might want to use the simple query protocol if you accept that it's simpler, of course. Um, but yeah, let's start with the simple query protocol. It basically looks like this. You, the client sends a query message and the query message contains the SQL text that you want to execute. So that's very simple. The server responds with a few different messages. Uh, First, there's the row description, which is basically what are the columns, what are the names of the columns, the data types, and so forth, like the shape of the result set. Uh, then there's one data row message for every row in the result set. And finally, the comment completion message. What you see there, the select two, that's what's called a, a command tag. So it tells the client back like what kind of a query was this. 
it's select for anything that is like a select, but it can be insert, update, delete if it was one of those commands. Um, and I guess we also have alter table, you know, all kinds of commands. But the number there, the select two, that means that it returns two rows, which isn't that important for selects because you can just count the rows anyway. Uh, but if it's an insert, for example, it will return the number of rows inserted, uh, or if it's an update, the number of uh, rows updated. Uh, so the client, many clients actually show that like that. Finally, there's a ready for query message again. It's the same one that you got uh, like earlier here, uh, like right right after authentication. So whenever the, the server sends the ready for query message, it means that you know it's it's currently idle. It has nothing more to do. Like you can send the next query. Extended query protocol. It's not that different, but it's, it does a few more steps. Um, so in the extended query protocol, like the, the client sends multiple messages, like there's a few different phases. Uh, the first one is the parse. It again contains the query text, just like in the simple query protocol. But because it's extended, you can have query parameters there, uh, and there's a few other options. Next, you will send the bind message which uh, like you give the, the the actual arguments for those query parameters for example like one two three four that would be the parameter number one there then the client will usually this is optional but usually the client will send a describe a message which just requests that the server sends back the row description uh in the simple protocol you always get that but in the extended query protocol you have to explicitly ask for that uh and to finally execute, and that's when the server will actually start to execute the, the query. The client typically sends all of these is just one like TCP packet. It's not like you have to do multiple round trips or anything. Uh, they're they always you know you send them together in practice. Uh, the server will reprocess them as separate messages, uh, and then you get the result back. So the parse message first of all comes in two variants. There's the, what's called the unnamed unnamed query, it's the unnamed variant, and then there's the named, named variant. Uh, basically, the unnamed variant is used for one-off queries. Like if you just want to run one query, uh, you would typically use that one. Uh, but if you use the named variant, you then it means that you have to, you give the, the statement a name, and now you're actually creating a prepared statement, uh, just like you would with the actual prepare like SQL command. Uh, and it shares the same namespace too. Like you can create a prepared statement using the parse message at the protocol level. And then you can use the execute SQL command to execute that later or vice versa. Uh, so this is actually very flexible. I don't think anyone does that. That that kind of tends to just get confusing. Uh, usually you either use the protocol messages uh, or you use the, the SQL commands. But in any case, the parse message creates a prepared statement. The unnamed prepared statement is really just a prepared statement where the name is an empty string. Uh, like that's how we treat of it, treat it uh, in the internally. There's, I think there's a few cases where we have some special handling for it. Uh, but basically you can reuse the unnamed variant as well. So you can send a parse message and then you can reuse that unnamed uh, prepared statement multiple times just with new query parameters too. Usually you would probably want to give it a name, but it works with the unnamed one as well. Uh, the next message is bind. So in the bind message, you give it the prepared statement or the empty string if you want to use the unnamed one. Uh, but then you also give the destination portal name. In in the like Postgres vocabulary, the portal is the same as a cursor. Uh, internally, we call them portals. Uh, but you can also use like the declare cursor command to explicitly like create a, a portal or cursor uh, at the SQL level. Uh, so yeah, the bind message gives in the bind message you pass all of the query parameters, and uh, there's also one field which is like whether you want to use the text protocol or the binary protocol for, well, actually for the for the query parameters, but also for the result set. So this uh, you you specify that at this stage. Uh, yeah, so this creates a named portal or again, here's the same thing as with the parse message. You can create an unnamed portal or cursor or a named one. Uh, usually you use the unnamed one I, unless you actually want to deal with multiple cursors going on at the same time and then start to fetch from both at the same time. I don't really see this much these days, but um, it's kind of an old school way of doing database stuff, I guess, to use these long-lived cursors. 
So usually you would use the unnamed one. The third message is the described one. Again, it comes in two variants. Uh -huh. You can do a portal describe or a statement describe. In the portal describe message, you, you get back the row description uh, for, the, for the portal you already created. Like you use this variant after you have bound, like after the bind message. But what you can also use the statement described variant before you bind the query parameters. If you, so this would be for clients that want to do like create a prepared statement, then do a describe on that to get back information of what are the query, what are the data types of the query parameters for the statement I just prepared because the client doesn't necessarily know that. Uh, so you can use the statement variable uh, variant for that. Finally, there's the execute message, which takes us in like one of the parameters, uh, like the name of the portal you want to execute. You can include a row count, like if you don't want to fetch all of the rows at the, in one go, uh, you can specify a row count or you can leave that out and then it will return like the whole result set in one go. Uh, if you specify a row count, then you can send multiple execute messages to, to fetch them, you know, in paging or whatnot, uh, fetch them uh, in smaller batches. And maybe send some other queries while you know while you're while you're doing other stuff. Um, the support for all of this interleaving and pipelining and like using multiple cursors and all of that, this is what the wire protocol supports. Uh, but how much you can actually do these things in your driver, that varies. Like some of the drivers give you very, you know, pass through a lot of these features so you can use them. Others are much more dumb and they just kind of follow through one script. Uh, and if they don't give you the flexibility for better or worse, I, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure you should be using all of these different features anyway. So that might be a good thing. I'm not sure. One thing I didn't mention yet is the synchronization step. So actually when you send the parse bind execute messages, the server doesn't immediately respond to you. It will just parse the messages, process them, but it doesn't immediately send you a response. It will buffer the responses until you send a sync message. Uh, so what you actually do, you send these four messages, parse, bind, execute, maybe describe, uh, and you'd end that. Once you've done all of that, then you send a sync, and now the server will say, oh, okay, now, you actually, now you're actually waiting for the response, and it will send all of the responses it had accumulated. It might start to send the responses earlier, too, if the buffer uh, gets full, but it usually doesn't, unless it's a big result set. Uh, so yeah, the, the so after each logical statement, the client sends this sync message. Uh, the server can also send an error message, like if there's an error in your query, uh, if you get canceled, if the server dies, uh, for a, you know any reason really, the server can decide to send an error message message uh, at any time. And when you do that, like when when some when an error happens, the the server will go into kind of an error mode where it doesn't process any more of your, your client's requests. It will just uh, throw them away, basically, uh, until it sees the next sync message. And that's kind of when you go back into the normal state where you can accept the next, uh, next transaction or next, next statement. So these sync messages are kind of a way for the client to group your, uh, group your statement, group these messages into logical statements the, that kind of makes sense for the client point of view. And when you actually want to, uh, get these responses back. So here's one example of that. You might run two queries like this in a pipelining mode kind of. Uh, so you might send parse for select foo, bind, execute, and then another query, find uh, bind, execute without waiting for the responses in between, and then just send one sync message at the end. And this is very efficient. Like the server can start to process this uh, as you go and you don't need to wait, like, wait for the latency. Uh, but the sync message is important here because if one of these uh, uh, if one of these uh, messages errors out, what it will happen like if if the first query uh, produces an error, it will also roll back or not even execute the second uh, query because you have the sync at the end. Uh, there's another message similar to sync, but not quite. There's a, what's called a flush which doesn't change the error, um, the error state, and it doesn't uh, like end the logical uh, statement, but it will force the server to just send whatever responses you have at that point uh, back to the client. 
Yes. If the server is producing results faster than the client can consume it, and we also have a limitation on the network bandwidth, is there also buffering on the client side for that case so that the, the server can continuously stream data for the client to consume? Right. Well, that would depend on the, on the client. Uh, like nothing in the protocol level can affect, affect that. LibBQ will do some... I mean, there's the TCP buffers. Yeah, you probably have a better answer. Yeah, like T TCP will, will do that buffering for you. Once the TCP receive buffer fills up, then the server will be blocked on, you know, sending more. Depends on the client, what kind of, you know, what other buffering you might do. But yeah, there's nothing in the protocol level to kind of do that. If you want to control that, then the way to do that would be to use the, like, have a row count in your uh, execute message so that it kind of tells the server to stop after 100 rows or 1,000 rows or something. And then you don't need to kind of read through the whole result set if you want to, for example, stop reading and do something else instead. Uh, that would be the way to do that then. Like, I think many clients have like a fetch count uh, option or something that you can you can specify to do that. Any more questions on the query protocols? Yes. So if I would like to get this uh, fetching uh, by 100 rows, so how it would look like? So I am uh, execute 100 and then sync for server to get me 100. And then I assume server won't, won't send me ready for query because it's still having some ready. So I would have to execute 100, row, 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 row uh, sync. And Again, execute 100, server will sync, server send me row, 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 but only it will send me only ready for query when everything is sent. Right, now I'm trying to remember how it works. Oh. I think the, you, get the you get the ready for query only after you have a send a sync. So until uh. you get the sync, you will not get the ready for query. So, um, oh, okay, so let me get one step further. I'm, I'm try trying to think, let's say yeah. I'm writing crazy query which in theory could could send me a million of rows but i want to stop after 100 or 1000 right. rows or something like this so how should i s tell postgres to stop not send anymore yeah so that goes into the you can't like you have to specify the number of rows beforehand yeah. uh you have to tell in the execute message you have to specify 1000 yeah. and then the server will send 1000 messages and now I'm not sure. I think you will get the command completion at that point, maybe. I don't think there's any other way it could indicate that. Uh, so it will send, let's assume that's right. Uh, it will send a command completion saying, okay, select 100, uh, 1,000. And then you can send a new execute message to fetch the next 1,000 records and, 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 and so forth. So you send as many execute messages as you need uh, and it will keep fetching from the, from the same portal. Okay, and then I guess I would have to send cancellation if I don't uh, want to have any more. Yeah, at some point you can just oh, there's a close message. So if you uh -huh. don't want like if you don't want to if you want to close the portal without re like reading everything through to the end, you can actually close it explicitly huh. uh, with the close. Okay, thanks. Uh, also, I think if you're using the unnamed portal, if you execute a new query using this, the unnamed portal, it will kind of close it for you automatically. So yeah, if you want to stop before reading all the rows, you can, you can close the portal and that will not cause a rollback either. Like that's different from cancellation. If you do cancellation, it will like actually abort the transaction and so forth. But with the portal, portal you can just can stop reading. Um, but yeah, you have to specify the number of rows beforehand. There's no way to start fetching everything and then change your mind and actually say that, you know, you can stop now. There's, there's no message for that. So that's how you run queries. Um, the next part is going to be the copy protocol. The, the copy protocol is used, well, for the copy command, obviously, um, but in particular for the copy from STD in, copy from STD out, like this is the way you load data fastest uh, into, into Postgres uh, or, or, or vice versa, if you want to read data from, from Postgres uh, fast. So, there's a special mode for the copy command, which which you know it's it's kind of special in the at the uh, protocol level. Um, there's two modes. 
uh, I always have to think a little bit like which one is which, but copy in means you are sending messages into the server and copy out means you are sending like rows out of the server. Uh, so that means copy in is for, for copy table from STD in and copy out is for, uh, uh, for the, for the other direction. So the way this looks like you, first of all, you send the copy command as a regular, uh, you know, using the simple query protocol, simple query protocol or the extended one I talked about earlier, uh, just like any other query. But instead of starting to send you the rows, the server will actually respond with a copy in response message. And this this tells you that this was a copy command and now you have entered a copy mode. In the copy mode, uh, in this case, if you're sending data from client to the server, in the copy mode, the client will send copy data messages to the server. And th that's like pretty much the only thing you can do. Uh, so you will send copy data messages, which contain you know, the, the data you want to send. Uh, and you can send as many of, of these messages as you want until, until, and when you're done, you send a copy done message. Uh, at this point, you exit the copy mode and the server will send a command completion. And so that's like the same you got with the regular queries. Uh, and, you know, you get the row count for how many rows were copied and, and ready for a query. So, so the same thing in the other direction is the same, except that it's the server sending the copy data messages. Uh, you can't do like you can't run other queries at the same time like while you're in copy mode you can't do other queries you can't run portals prepare statements any of those other things all you can do is to send more data or end the copy mode there's also error messages like the server can send an error message at any point but even an error message doesn't immediately like terminate the copy mode there's going to be a copy fail message after that saying uh, it's the same as copy data but it just says you know it didn't actually succeed so you wrote back uh, the copy data messages are basically just a stream of data. That's how I think about them. Because uh, the copy, like if you read the documentation of what your copy, the format of the copy is, like that depends on the copy command. So you can have uh, in text format, binary format, CSV files, uh, and then there's all of these options for delimiter escaping all of that. Uh, so the contents of the stream of data you send depends on all of those options. But it doesn't show in the protocol level. For at this protocol level, it's just a stream of data, just a stream of bytes. Except there's one exemption that is documented. Uh, in the copy out mode, the server will actually send, it will chunk the messages so that each row of data is actually sent in a separate copy data message. I wouldn't necessarily recommend relying on this. I was kind of surprised when I found this out myself because I was. I had the great idea that I noticed that we're doing that. It's kind of wasteful if you're just copying a single column to send a separate message for each. So what if we didn't do that? But then I found out that we have actually documented that in the in the in the <laughs> protocol documentation, so we can't change that. Uh, but in the other direction, the client can chunk the the copy data into whatever chunks is convenient, like you know, megabyte or, or eight kilobytes or or it's row in a separate message, like whatever you want. The server will piece it back together, and uh, and, and it what actually matters for the is the all the delimiter and escaping and uh, end of line uh, options for how it's parsed. One more fun topic: the replication protocol. Um, if you want to do streaming replication or or logical replication. Uh, it goes through the same wire protocol. We use the same wire protocol for that, but there's there's some nuance. Uh, so to enter the replication mode or replication protocol, what you do is that you use the replication option in the startup packet. Uh, and in that case, what you will actually do, you will open this special while sender backend in the server side. So at the, pro at the protocol level, it's the same, the same wire protocol. But instead of running regular queries, like you can't do select star from a table in this mode, what you will actually send are these special commands, which are like SQL queries. You send them with the same, you know, simple query protocol. But but there's a completely different set of commands that you can run. Here's a few examples. Like these are listed in the documentation. But identify system. If you send that, the client will respond with the result set of uh, I think there's a version number and uh, 
system identifier. There's a few fields, I don't remember what exactly, LSN, current LSN, so stuff like that, which is important for application purposes. There's a command to do timeline history. If you have multiple Postgres timelines, then you can you get a list of those and like what are the LSNs where they begin and end. Uh, you can create replication slots through this protocol. I think BG-based backup uses this. Like if you want to create a, a replication slot where while you're doing a base backup or whatnot, it will use these commands. Uh, so you don't need to use the regular uh, replication slot like SQL functions. But finally, there's the important one, which is start replication. Uh, like usually when you open a replication connection, it will do identify system, maybe timeline history, but then it will enter, it will send a, the client will send a start replication command. And that's when you kind of enter the, the real replication mode. And this is like the copy command. So when you send the start replication mode, the server will respond with a copy both message. So this is like the copy mode. Uh, it's like a third mode in addition to copy in and copy out. There is a copy both directions uh, mode, which we only use for replication. Uh, and in this mode, the client can send these copy data messages, but the server can also send copy data messages. So you can have a conversation going back and forth. And within these copy data messages, we have uh, another set of messages with the header as on payloads and uh which are similar to the main protocol messages, but they're nested inside the copy protocol. Uh, the, so yeah, the, when you enter this mode, there's like a separate set of these commands or, or the server can also send an error response at any point, like through the main protocol, if something goes wrong. But most, mo mostly what then happens in stream replication is that the server will just send these xlog data messages, which is just a chunk of wall, because that's what you're streaming. Uh, and it will keep sending those while chunks. And sometimes if the system is idle, then you might send keep alive messages to just to, so you don't time out at, at some network level. And also if you if you have a hot standby replica running, it will send feedback message, might send feedback messages to uh, uh, to prevent the like vacuum and stuff like that. But basically this is a little mini protocol inside the copy protocol of the main Postgres protocol, uh, which is a bit funny. Uh, the logical replication works similarly, like it's also started with the start replication command, but there's, I think there's some few other options, maybe probably logical or something, but, it, but it's a similar, similar mode. But the set of these nested messages is again different. Uh, in the logical replication protocol, you will have commands, uh, messages like begin, insert, update, delete, like these are what the server will send to the client, uh, and commit messages, and these kind of form the, the logical transactions that you're rep replicating. There's a whole bunch of other messages for for various things related to the protocol, but that's that's the gist of it. Um, any questions on replication? Yes. So in the initial synchronization stage of logical replication, does this tree also apply, or is it something other than that? Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's different. I think you open a regular connection and then you actually use copy, um, to, to, to send all of the data. If anyone knows better, but yeah, I think the initial stage doesn't use this protocol. Okay, but this all happens under the hood of logical replication, right? Yeah. This is like what the publisher and subscriber will do. All right. Next topic, we kind of touched on the cancellation already. Cancellation is a bit special. Um, so if you like start a long running query in PSQL and then you don't like to wait, uh, you can hit control C. And when you do that, what will actually happen is that the client opens a completely new TCP connection to the server to, to the same port, you know, like to the same address. Uh, but instead of then starting the regular handshake we went through in the beginning, it will send, instead of the startup packet, it will send a cancel request message. Uh, and this is where I mentioned in the beginning that the server sends the client like a secret token for cancellation purposes. This is where it comes in. So the, the cancel request includes that secret token. And uh, if the token is correct, the server will 
uh, or cancel the query, or like send the signal internally to cancel the query. Uh, if it's wrong, then it will do nothing. But uh, this is basically how the cancellation works. This might seem a bit complicated, like you, you would, it's kind of surprising to open a completely new connection just to, to cancel the old one. But the reason to do this is that the server might be blocked, like it might not be waiting for your messages at all. The, the buffers like from the client to the server, the TCP buffers might be full. So even if you try to send something on the same connection, it might not go anywhere because there's other you know, stuff already pipelined ahead of you. Uh, so that's why you have to use, or that's why we use a separate uh, TLS connection for that, uh, TCP connection for that. Um, this can be encrypted. Like uh, usually, I don't think PSQL does this, or maybe it does in recent versions, um, but historically it has not been encrypted. But what you can do, you can actually like go through the SSL request, handshake, establish a TCP con uh, TLS connection, and only then after the after you have the TLS connection, you send the cancel request. So that's an option. If you're writing new drivers nowadays, uh, please do that. That's much smarter. Uh, so, so you want to build a connection pooler? Uh, well, think twice. There's plenty of good ones already. Uh, if you went to Julian Markworth's presentation yesterday, there are a lot of connection poolers and they kind of all, all work the same. Uh, but there's a bunch of stuff like we just went through all of this, but there's a bunch of state in a connection that you need to take into account. And you, you, you know, your connection pooler needs to kind of deal with all of these things. It's the prepared statements I mentioned. There's the parse message that can have an unnamed or named variant. Cursors, again, you have an unnamed and named variant. Then there's the whole current transaction state. I didn't touch on that, but there is a like you can be in a board of transactions. And when you're in an abort of transaction, nothing will work until you do a rollback. Uh, uh, so you kind of have to keep track of that state somehow. There's the set variables. Uh, each connection also has a bunch of all kinds of caches that uh, I guess the I guess the pooler doesn't really need to care about, but it's part of the state. The cancellation is kind of tricky uh, in a pooler. Like I mentioned that there's the secret token, but if you have a man in the middle, like if you have a pooler, then it needs to kind of generate its own tokens and then have a mapping between the token it gave to the client and the token it's actually going to use to uh, on the pool connection. So it all kind of gets a little complicated. Uh, so all of this is doable, like the you know prepared statements. Like PG Bonzer just recently got support for prepared statements. And the way you do that too is that you kind of remember what prepared statements you got from the client and which ones you have already sent to the server on this connection. And then you do a mapping and uh, you know you, but then the names change, it doesn't quite work. If you also, you try to use the like SQL, execute SQL command to do, uh, you know, with the same statement. And there's like, there's all kinds of stuff that kind of usually works okay. But you know, if you really try to break it, it's not hard. Um, so, which is a bit, uh, on, uh, Unfortunate, like I wish the protocol was simpler and more friendly to connection poolers, actually. But that's a that's a different topic. The final topic I want to cover is extendability. Um, first of all, there is no mechanism for extensions, like Postgres extensions, to extend the protocol today. Um, so what I'm talking about here is actually like how can Postgres itself evolve the protocol in the future. Uh, so the current version is 3.0. Uh, like three is the major version, we call it, and zero is the minor version. Uh, and there is a mechanism for for negotiating this uh, this this protocol, which was introduced in version ten or eleven or something like that. So it should be there in in all of the supported versions. Uh, but because we have never done this, we actually like you don't see these protocol negotiations happening in the wild. So again, whether your connection pooler actually implements this correctly or not. Uh, but I think we just fixed, or PG browser folks just fixed a few of the uh, bugs there, actually. Uh, there's a second mechanism, like aside from bumping the version number, what we can do in the future is uh, there is a, like a list of supported extensions similar to what you might have with TLS, for example. In the startup packet, the client can send a list of extensions, and then the server will re respond with the list of extensions out of those, like the subject that the server also supports. And that way you can kind of uh, use the lowest common de denominator between the client and server. Now, what might we see in the future? Uh, all right, yeah. 
what I just said. Uh, if you're writing any code that does like speaks the Postgres protocol, please actually test the protocol uh, negotiation because we might like even though you don't never see it today. Uh, we would actually like to start using it. Like we would actually start to extend, start adding new features to the protocol, and that kind of assumes that uh, all of the clients and drivers and uh, poolers and all, all so forth actually support this message side and negotiation. Otherwise, they will just stop working uh, when when we bump the version or add ex uh, extensions. So there are two uh, two patches in the queue currently, like in commit fest. There's one from Yelte uh, to do. Change the set of GUX that we report with the parameter status I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and one by me, which is to make the query cancellation tokens larger. Like I said, you know, it's a magic secret token, but it's only four bytes at the moment, which isn't really very secure. Uh, so to make that larger so that you can't cancel other people's queries. Um, so, but both of these will require by either bumping the version number or creating one of these extensions. And if we do that, then we will find out if any of the poolers out there are actually doing the negotiation correctly. There's one more idea I actually want to pitch. If there's anyone who wants to write some Postgres code in the audience, uh, it would be really nice to have a, like a progress bar uh, for SQL queries. And I think that would be another case where we would want to extend the protocol so that the server could send these like status messages of you know how far is your vacuum or command so you could get a little nice progress bar in psql would be another would be another feature that actual users might want to have and, and ask for these are kind of all in the back end just to make things more secure or not break uh, which is kind of invisible to users um thanks that's that's all the material i had uh questions What about listen and notify? How does that work mm. through the wire protocol? I think there's a separate message type for the notify messages, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and the client kind of have to be prepared for that. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's that's a bit special. Uh, the parameter status is also special in that way that the, that the server can send it at any time uh, in principle. Uh, but yeah, you're right. That That's kind of deviates from the normal rule that you kind of send a response and wait for the request. So what about transaction? Is there any support for that in the protocol or is that just by sending begin and end commands? It's just by sending begin and commit. Um, there, the server will open a transaction. Like if you use, I mentioned earlier, like if you batch a bunch of uh, queries and you send a sync message only at the end, the, the server will create, like run both all of those messages in a single transaction. Uh, but other than that, like, uh, that's not how you usually do it. Usually it's with begin and commit. Hi. I'm not sure to understand the name it portal thing. Uh, are there drivers that use it and uh, why? Oh, sorry, can you repeat that? Sorry. Uh, um, are there drivers uh, that use the named portal um, feature and uh, how, um, why do they use it? So if you have a driver that uses the, uses the named portal, then because you you said that um, uh, usually it's a name portal, right? So why would you use the name uh, name portal? Yes. Uh, some drivers expose these features at the like to the to the application level, so you can like have multiple queries running and you can fetch from them independently. I think the ODBZ driver does that. Maybe JDBZ as well. I'm not sure. Um, like there's a some of these drivers have explicit support for creating a cursor, and then you would use then you use that feature. Okay, thanks. In the uh, handshake startup phase, when do you start counting against a configured max connections? And mm. in particular, can you always get into cancel, even if you're maxed out? That's a great question. I've been hacking on that recently. Uh, yes, you can always cancel. The server doesn't, the server will, 
it's a bit complicated. It, it will start to count against the max connections when after authentication. But there's 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 another limit, which is like two times max connections. If you go like if you have more than two times max connections, number of connections just wait, you know, waiting to do authentication or actually running, then then the, the server will start to fork what's called dead end backends. And the dead end backend is it to the client it looks like a normal, like it, it does no difference, except that it will always fail. Like it will never go get past the authentication. It will send an error after receiving the startup packet. But the dead end backends can also send the do the cancellation. So yeah, the cancellation will always work. The max connections are checked after authentication. So you can have 150 connections trying to authenticate, and the first hundred that will like go through the authentication successfully will will use the slots, uh, and the rest will will then fail after authentication. But if you have you know even more than that, then then you will start to kind of fail earlier. There there is there are some nasty cases which what I was hacking on, like we currently use the same slots or like there's some of these limits actually also apply to background workers. So it's possible today that if you open a lot of connections and you leave them hanging in the authentication phase, uh, you can't start background workers either. Uh, the server will fail to start background workers and I think auto vacuum workers as well, which is kind of bad, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll fix that soon. Thank you, Raiki. I think it's, it's time to change the rooms and uh, I'll continue this nice conference. Thank you. Thank you.